Welcome to Electron Online. And our next topic in thermodynamics is the mechanical equivalence of heat. Back in the days when they're trying to understand what heat really was and they're trying to figure out, well, heat is, seems to be some sort of energy, they wanted to be able to figure out the equivalence between mechanical energy and heat. And they said that somehow we need to be able to equate the two. So let's say we have mechanical energy. And somehow, through some sort of mechanism, we can try to figure out how that equates to heat being generated. And so the experiment that was set up was a, uh, a container that contained water. And in the container, there was a structure here with paddles that if you turn this around, the paddles would, of course, turn around as well. That would agitate the water. And somehow that agitation would then, of course, increase the temperature of the water. And then you would measure the, the change. And somehow you want to be able to figure out about how much work you put into that system and how much of that work then would then be converted to heat. And the way the work was done so that we could measure this, we'd have an object like this with mass m connected to some pulleys to the drive right here. And as you let go, the mass would come down, causing the pedals to turn around. And all its potential energy would then be converted into heat by uh, increasing the temperature of the water. So the mechanical energy in this case was potential energy. And the potential energy somehow had to, had to equal the heat that was being generated. And of course, potential energy, in the case of a mass like that, that would be mgh. And that equals to the uh, heat being generated. So let's say we had a mass that was equal to 10 kilograms. Let's say that we had a height equal to 1 meter. Of course, g, the acceleration of the gravity, is 9.8 meters per second square. How much heat would be generated? Well, let's find out. So the mass being at 10 kilograms and g being 9.8 meters per second squared and then height being one meter that would then be of course equal to the heat that was generated and so 10 times that is 98 times that, that would be 98 joules is equal to the heat being generated now that was a difficult experiment because 98 joules is not exactly a lot of heat and um, and so 98 joules added to water, if there was a substantial amount of water, the temperature change would be virtually imperceptible. And so you couldn't really measure the change in the temperature. So what they did then is they started doing some other experiments where they added more masses or somehow they used the crank, hand crank, to do something to add a lot more potential energy, a lot more kinetic energy to the system so that the numbers here would go up quite a bit. And then to, the, to a point where we could actually measure the change in the temperature and then there would be some equivalence between the heat being generated and the mechanical energy being put into the system. So now also they said, well, we have to find some way to, to uh, calculate the heat that's being added to the water. So here we have a substance that heat is put into it and that the temperature would go up. And so they say that the amount of heat, so Q would be the amount of heat added to the system, would somehow equal to some constant times the mass of the water times the change in the temperature. So we need to know what the mass of the water is. So let's say mass of H2O times the change in temperature of the water times some constant. And they realized then that different substances would be able to absorb different amounts of heat with the same amount of temperature change. So they called that, that constant the coefficient of heat retention or the, or the uh, coefficient of heat of that particular material. And so they call that C. And so then we had a means of equating the two. So from that point, we then say that mgh would be equal to cm of the water times delta t. And it turns out that uh, the mechanical equivalence, of course, through a lot of experimentation and a lot of uh, real good efforts in the laboratory, they then discovered that when they somehow ended up with one kilogram of water, and we had a change in the temperature of delta T equal to 1 centigrade degree. And if they put in an equivalent of 4,198 joules, or 4.186, not quite 98. My numbers are slightly off. I think it's 4,186 joules of mechanical energy that would then take 1 kilogram of water and raise it by one degree centigrade and therefore they say well then we can
figure out what the C is equal to for water. And so when you calculate that, then C is equal to 4,186 joules per one kilogram of water times one degree centigrade change, or one centigrade degree change, I should write, like that. So therefore, we found the, what we would call the coefficient of heat for the water, and that ended up to be 4,186 joules for one kilogram water for one centigrade degree change. So therefore, we had that equivalence between you put in a certain amount of mechanical energy in the system, which will cause the water to heat up by a certain amount. If you, have, if you know how much water you have, you know how much the temperature increase is, then you can calculate the amount of heat put into that by calculating mechanical energy. And then therefore, we can calculate the heat co coefficient of that particular substance, in this case, water. And that was then the basis of the understanding of the mechanical equivalence of heat. Turned out the very famous uh, French physicist, Joule, was the one who figured this out. So therefore, from now on, the unit of energy is called the Joule, and that's then in honor of the person who figured all this out for us. So that's how we then discovered the equivalence, mechanical equivalence of heat.